Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Circular Metabolism podcast. I'm your host, Aristide from Metabolism of Cities. In this podcast, we interview thinkers, researchers, policymakers, and practitioners to better understand the metabolism of our cities and how to reduce their environmental impact in a socially just and context specific way. In this new episode, I want to explore the, a concept that has been extremely popular over the last decade or, or so uh, in the fields of research, practice, and policy, especially in urban areas. And I think it was even more present during this current pandemic, of course. However, as we will discover later in this episode, there is a lot of fuzziness around this uh, topic, uh, but there are a lot of stakes. Um, so we need a clear definition and we need to better define it in order to better implement it. The concept I'm referring to is urban resilience. And to talk about it, I'm very lucky to have Sarah Mero, which is, uh, I hope I'm pronouncing your, your name. Your last name yeah, correctly? Sarah Miro, yep, you're right. <laughs> um, who has wrote many articles on the topic, and she is uh, an assistant professor at the Arizona State University, uh, which has a, actually a lot of uh, uh, great researchers uh, over there, um, and is an interdisciplinary social, social ecological system scientist that works at the intersection between urban geography and planning. Um, and you really work on trying to understand what is urban resilience and making cities more resilient. Uh, and we have many outward shocks such as climate change, social, uh, uh, social change or social challenges and environmental challenges. And so what is, I think, very interesting is that you work both on the theory side, but also on the practical side of how to implement urban resilience. And I hope we're going to discuss with some concrete examples as well. So with all that, all that being said, Sarah, thanks a lot for taking the time for this episode. And uh, yeah, could you perhaps give a short uh, intro of who, who you are or what you're doing uh, uh, in, sure. in your research terms? <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so yeah, so I, as you mentioned, I'm an assistant professor in the School of Geographical Sciences and Urban Planning at Arizona State University. I'm also affiliated, so I'm a senior sustainability scientist in the Global Institute of Sustainability and Innovation at ASU. Um, and I also am an affiliate um, and uh, member of the Urban Climate Research Center as well, um, and then do a, you know work with a lot of different folks. So yeah, I'm really a very interdisciplinary scholar. Um, you know, my PhD is from a, an interdisciplinary school uh, as well as actually my master's uh, was also an interdisciplinary program. But, you know, I do generally work at the intersections of, of urban planning and geography, I would say, is where I, I most closely align myself. Um, and yeah, my work really is focused on how we can make cities more resilient, right? Um, you know, particularly in the face of climate change, um, but also other hazards and how we can do this in a way that's also, you know, still sustainable and also just. So trying to think about how we can... Um, yeah, manage those different goals and, and where there are potentially trade-offs between them. Um, so in general, I would say my research to date has mostly focused on sort of three areas, right? So first of those, and I'm guessing what we'll talk uh, a lot about today is, is conceptualizations of urban resilience, right? Really in sort of theory, but also in practice. Um, I also uh, doing work on really on planning for urban resilience in a changing climate. Um, and particularly thinking about it, how we plan for urban resilience to sort of specific hazards as well. Um, and then finally thinking about green infrastructure as you know, one increasingly popular strategy, right? For enhancing social ecological resilience and how we can plan this again in a way that uh, is maybe more strategic um, and also tries to, to think about how we can sort of maximize different uh, social and ecological benefits. Mm -hmm. And also mm. do it in a way that is is just right. <laughs> yeah, there's always this last sentence, which of course we're going to discuss it later. Makes a huge difference because uh, if we don't add it, then well, uh, anyhow. Uh, what is interesting is that I think you're not an urban planner from you know by training, right? So you did uh, political sciences, uh, sciences, and international development studies, right? So how did you really arrive to this? Uh, topic or yeah resilience urban planning and all of that yeah it's a great question um so so i 
yeah. So as a, in my bachelor's, I really didn't know anything about urban planning, was not really exposed to it. I did my, my undergraduate in political science and history, um, also like a minor in anthropology. So I was really thinking a lot about different social sciences and really interested in those. I was already interested in, in environmental issues and particularly like sort of the connections between, um, you know, environmental issues, natural resources and politics and governance, right? Mm -hmm. So I was, I was thinking about those things, um, but not really particularly in an urban context. And actually where I really got exposed to urban planning and started to think about it, as well as geography actually, was, was in my master's. So I did my master's in international development studies at the University of Amsterdam. And that was a, a department that was the Department of Geography, Urban Planning and International Development. And so, you know, in many ways, that was really where I was, I was first introduced to these ideas. I went into the uh, master's actually thinking that I would, you know, focus on development studies and not sure, not necessarily specifically focused on, you know, sustainable development. But as I took more classes, I, I became increasingly focused on that and decided that, that was really what I was most interested in. Um, and actually, that was also where I was first exposed to the concept of resilience. Um, so. Okay. Two of my professors in the, the program had uh, basically gave an elective that was on resilience and they were trying to think about what urban resilience uh, would mean from a governance perspective. And, you know, this was back in 2009. So this is pretty, you know, early in the, the urban resilience <laughs> uh, world, I would say, when the, the urban resilience agenda was just sort of starting to, to take off, um, you know, but really not, not very um, big at that point. And so, yeah, I just really, it really resonated with me. Um, and I thought it was a really interesting perspective and theory and approach. And so I actually did my master's research, thesis research, okay. um, thinking about renewable energy policies in Thailand and thinking about how they would relate to resilience, taking sort of theorized characteristics of resilience and trying to apply those, thinking about these these policies and how they affected both the physical system and governance, right? And I think in some ways that's, you know, what I've been trying to do kind of since then is thinking about, okay, physical, how do we combine th thinking about physical infrastructure in cities as well as a social infrastructure and governance and, and how do those relate with each other and how do we ultimately, um, you know, yeah, work to, to enhance resilience of both. And I think that's one of the things that's really interesting about resilience as a, an agenda, as an approach, is that it really is applied to both, right? We think we apply resilience thinking to, to physical infrastructure, um, but we also apply it to, uh, you know, and ecosystems as well. So ecological infrastructure, physical infrastructure, built infrastructure, and then governance and how we really manage these uh, ecological or physical systems. And then, yeah, how they're all connected. Yeah, super interesting. Well, of course, I'm also asking because, you know, uh, it's very similar. I arrived to urban metabolism in a very similar fashion. There is no, let's say, bachelor in that topic or there's no master's in that topic. So you kind of arrive from different directions. And I'm always curious, what is the baggage of a person <laughs> behind it, right? I mean, it tells a lot when you understand like, oh, okay, that, that's interesting. That, that person kind of has this twist on urban resilience. So perhaps, you know, you doing anthropology might have a, a very, a, you know, a, a severe implications on you um, being so interested into the just element, right? Or to international uh, development, knowing, well, focusing on the entire world and the hinterland ramifications and all of that. So yeah, I'm generally quite uh, interested to know what does that mean? Uh, bring to the conversation and especially in these also hybrid topics or interdisciplinary topics such as resilience because as you said I can imagine this is a very well there is no one discipline really to to approach resilience is there no absolutely not right I think and actually I think that's one of the in many ways one of the biggest selling points of resilience <laughs> is that it really I do think it really does um act in this way, sort of as a boundary object, bringing together different disciplines, different agendas, right? I mean, the fact that you have people who are really focused on, you know, 
say terrorism, right? And and yeah. dealing with that in a city, planning for for that, talking with urban ecologists um, or reading each other's papers, right? That I think th- that's really interesting and unique, and I think it does open up, yeah, opportunities for discussion and potentially even you know new ways of of new policies and um, different planning approaches that maybe wouldn't otherwise be there. So I do think that interdisciplinary aspect is really important. And that was something that when I went to do my PhD, that was what I was, I was really interested in that, right? I, I, one of the reasons I ended up going to the University of Michigan, um, into the, the, you know, interdisciplinary environmental school there was because I liked the fact that I could draw on different disciplines. I could have different, um, you know, take different courses and everyone there was really open to interdisciplinarity. And that's actually another thing that I, I really like about Arizona State University is that that is something that is really, you know, woven through the entire university fabric is, is an emphasis on interdisciplinarity and collaboration. And I just think when we talk about these issues of urban resilience or urban sustainability, you have to be thinking in interdisciplinary ways. You, you know, obviously we need people who really dig in deep to a particular topic and issue, but we also need people who think across systems um, and, you know, are, are making those linkages. And I think we end up, um, a lot of our problems are, are because we, you know, have very siloed thinking sometimes, right? And so I think we have to, to break some of those, those boundaries down. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, um, so perhaps for the people who are listening and watching, so urban resilience, um, let's go through it. Uh, so whenever I hear resilience, the, the definition I, I have in mind, and I, I don't know where I've heard it or read it, but it's, you know, the, um, the capacity to absorb an external shock, let's say, uh, or an external um, event, uh, or to come back to the initial state or something like that after a, a shock. Uh, but uh, I, I wrote, uh, I read, uh, sorry, your, your paper on the definitions on um, urban resilience. And of course, there are just so many others. Um, and so you, you kind of scrutinized all of the definitions that exists uh, from the seminal paper of Hollings, and we'll get back to that because unfortunately I haven't read it yet. So I'm curious to, to know what, what was there until I think 2014 or 2015. Um, so perhaps can you share a bit th- this uh, experience of scrutinizing these definitions and what do they tell us or you know, how do they help us understand what is urban resilience? Yeah, no. Um, so, so yeah, so for this, this paper, we really reviewed, right. Um, the, we did sort of a systematic literature review of the, of the literature at the time, um, which was a lot smaller than it is today, <laughs> yeah, <for of> course. <laughs> <laughs> but in t- 2015 of urban resilience and, um, you know, we then pulled out these definitions and we also looked more broadly. And what we found was that there were these sort of what we called, uh, you know, theoretical or conceptual tensions, right, mm. um, in the resilience literature, and we looked specifically at whether uh, the the twenty five def- different definitions that we found in the literature, how they sort of fell along these uh, these tensions, right? And so the six tensions were first, you know, how they were thinking about what uh, a city is, and what we found, for example, is that many of the the studies of urban resilience actually never define what they mean by urban, right? And we know that this is an incredibly contested concept. Lots of people have theorized what is urban, what's not, what is the city, right? Is it, for example, uh, a network of flows, right? Or is it a a system um, that has, you know, boundaries? Uh, How is it connected again to, you know, the hinterlands? Uh, All of these different aspects, what what is it made up of? Um, And yeah, and just a lot of the definitions you know, didn't, didn't really um, specify, right? Um, in the broader resilience literature, there's a lot of focus on, on this idea of complex adaptive systems. It's really, you know, coming more from the, the social ecological uh, or ecological resilience literature. And yeah, I mean, there was often a mention, you know, discussion that cities, um, cities are examples of, or maybe even prototypical example of the, the complex adaptive system, right? Uh, but yeah, how was this this discussed and elaborated? So we so that was one tension, um, and we actually tried to with creating a new definition. Tried to 
specifically take a stand on each of these um, tensions, right? Mm. So for example, we tried to develop a conceptual sort of schematic of um, what would be the different systems and elements of a city that you would need to think of if you say wanted to develop a really comprehensive resilience plan or set of policies. Um, and so we sort of said, well, cities we think are, are complex, again, complex adaptive systems. They're, they include social, ecological, and technical components, right? Um, and we sort of divided these into uh, governance networks, um, increasingly really globalized material and energy resource flow. So again, recognizing that, um, you know, it's kind of artificial to just put a boundary around a city and say, you're gonna focus on the resilience of that city, right? Because they are inherently connected, um, you know, through flows of information, resources, people um, across, you know, around the world. Um, there is also urban infrastructure, which we included ecological infrastructure as part of that. Um, and then there's, of course, really important social and economic dynamics and, you know, things like equ uh, equity and justice, but also capital, right, fit, fit into that. So um, so that was our, our attempt to try to, to make some sense of that. And, you know, obviously you could, you know, you could organize those in lots of different ways. Um, but the, the point is that you would need to, again, to really think comprehensively about urban resilience, you would need to take all of those into account. And you need to recognize that they, um, they're changing and that they really, you know, are across, you know, they're going across different scales, um, which is another, I think, important sort of point from that you draw from this, the ecological, social ecological resilience. So, okay. So that was just one tension, right? <laughs> um, there's five others. So uh, we had, the second was this idea of, of whether resilience, um, whether these systems have a particular equilibrium um, or whether they have multiple equilibriums. And so then is resilience about returning to uh, and that previous equilibrium after some kind of disruption because in you know at its core resilience is usually about uh about dealing with change dealing with disruption right mm -hmm. stresses or shocks that's really what it is about um and i think i think it's recognizing that that those changes um and those disruptions are probably to some extent inevitable um and that we need to be prepared for, for change and for disruption. And we need to really foster our sort of inherent capacity to deal with that, right? So that, that to me is, is really the fundamental uh, point of resilience. Um, and yeah. But, and which can be core, seen as, I, I imagine you can also act to change something preemptively or mm -hmm. react to it because it's something external. So I can imagine that this equilibrium is both a good thing and a bad thing. Yeah, yeah. And I think, so the idea here, so so this idea that, you know, of resilience, so there, and there are different, these these different, this is, gets at some of these different definitions, right? Um, there are still, I think, a lot, of, a lot of people who are thinking about resilience really as just bouncing back to the previous state, right? So thinking about this, that there is an equilibrium currently and we want to return to that as quickly as possible, right? Um, what I sometimes call the like bounce back resilience. Uh, then there's there's others which is coming this is and that's more what some people also call engineering resilience right mm -hmm. that idea of, of bouncing back um, or resisting change in the first place then there's uh, more the ecological this is the traditional hauling kind of definition of resilience which said that hey actually there are multiple um, equilibrium states equilibria states that systems can be in um, and it's about maintaining key functions and characteristics, um, you know, in the face of resilience. So it's about how much disruption can it take before it moves into this fundamentally different, uh, also equilibrium state. So multiple equilibrium. And then there's this idea of a sort of social ecological resilience, sometimes called evolutionary resilience, which says that there's actually no equilibrium, right? And that systems are constantly changing. And it's just really about your ability to okay. adapt and learn as a result while keeping those really key functions that you need. Um, and sort of we take the um, we take the position that resilience, that urban resilience should be more on this, more towards this non-equilibrium um, perspective, right? Because cities are just so dynamic um, and, and that therefore, yeah, but if you take this idea that resilience is is um, has you know is sort of not an equilibrium, then you do have to recognize that um, 
that it's going to incorporate some, that it's going to have sort of this, uh, that you're going to need to have change in the system, right? That it's not going to be always about uh, staying the same. And so that's another one of these tensions is about the sort of pathway towards resilience, right? So, um, you know, so some would say that resilience is all about, again, like persisting in the same way. That's that idea of, of bouncing back, right? Or even resistance. Um, others argue that resilience incorporates that actually achieving or working towards urban resilience incorporates different um, amounts of change, right? So it could be that it allows for sort of uh, small changes, more incremental things, um, more of a, you know, transitions uh, in there, or it could require, you know, it could incorporate transformation, right? Um, and so this is this idea that resilience, and I think we're increasingly seeing more push to, uh, to shift towards more of this, um, to allow transformation, right? And to recognize that, that if resilience is going to be a positive goal for our cities, right? Something that we want to work towards if it's going to be normative um, and that we have seen, you know, if the, what we found was that in the urban resilience literature, no one was really suggesting that urban resilience could be a negative thing, right? In the ecological resilience literature, there are, there's definitely recognition that resilience, um, you can have positive and negative resilience, right? You can have very resilient, but very say unsustainable um, or undesirable states. And when it comes to thinking though, holistically about cities, most people seem to think that, um, that they want their city to be resilient, right? Um, to persist over time kind of thing. And so if that's the case, if resilience is gonna be this normative goal, then we have to, I would argue, have to have um, build in a, an amount of sort of allow for transformation and allow for change. Um, because otherwise it really becomes this very conservative, small C, right? Not like um, political conservative <laughs> uh, goal, right? Where it's really just about, yeah, about um, resisting change. And, and so I think what we argue is that different systems within that, the broader city, right? Different elements will have to be actually uh, changed in order to achieve sort of more overall resilience, right? So you might have to, you might have some elements of the city that you really just want to enhance the robustness of, you want them to persist, right? You want a building, for example, to be able to withstand hurricane force winds, right? So um, there might be elements where you are really, you know, just focusing on strengthening. There might be other aspects of, of urban systems that you really want to fundamentally transform and change um, and that those, you know, that you have to really think about, about that and you have to incorporate those different sort of what we call pathways within um, broader resilience goals. So that's another aspect. And, and that, then I think, oh, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, just for that, I'm, because I'm thinking it, it strikes me when, you know, during this whole pandemic, we, we urge to go back to normal as soon as possible, right? But of course, going back to normal, there are some good things and some bad things about it. Of course, we we arrived to to this pandemic because of being normal, let's say, uh, because of you know destroying habitat and all of that. So, of course, there is not everything that we would need to go back to normal. So, what are the facets and what what, what is still uh, good and bad? So, there is indeed something normative about it, right? I mean, the, we cannot just say that resilience is per se something good so it's well it i guess it begs the question to to dissect which systems are good and which systems are bad and and what is good and what is bad but we'll get back to that in the in the different questions that you had at the end yeah yeah no i mean well that exactly i think that really bridges to that's what we that exact issue is what we argue is why you need to really think carefully about the the what we call the five W's of resilience, right? The questions of urban resilience for whom, what, um, at what, you know, spatial scale, temporal scale. So, you know, when and where, um, and then why, right? Like what are those those underlying goals and motivations? And and yeah, I mean, we so we try to to come up with a sort of broad definition um that you know can be used by different dif different disciplines um, that does take a stand a position on these conceptual tensions, um, right? But that is still broad enough that it could serve as this sort of boundary object. But we recognize that when it would actually come to like applying this definition um, in practice, again, developing a, say, resilience plan or policies, 
you would have to think through those five W questions because exactly that, that they're, um, yeah, they're really critical and they have to be negotiated, right? And those are inherently going to be political, um, contested, and that there are also going to be inherent trade-offs related to how you you answer and decide, you know, what things should be changed, right? Uh, versus what should be, um, you know, be more robust. But I think going back though to this idea, I, you know, I feel like there is this, this really big tension um, that, you know, it keeps coming up in my work between those who are really thinking about resilience just as this idea of, of bouncing back versus this idea that resilience actually could be about bouncing forward, right? So taking these disruptions, these changes and improving, right? Um, and I think the one of the things that is a little concerning is that, you know, I think in, in theory, you know, in, I guess, academic literature, I think there's a, a more recognition of this bounce forward. And I think that's really the, the way the literature is moving. But in practice, I think we do still, you know, in, in policy discourse, we do still see a lot of this idea of, of bouncing back, right? Um, I mean, I was, I was actually just looking at some survey results uh, as part of a project that I'm doing where we had asked different um, organizations in cities who are working on flood resilience planning to what their definition of resilience is. And there were a number of them. I mean, they, they varied, right? So some people were definitely talking about improving um, you know, changing systems, thinking about different different aspects of the city, but others were just really talking about resilience is about bouncing back or it's about building higher, you know, seawalls. Um, <laughs> and yeah, I think that this is something that, you know, has just has come up in a lot of a lot of the work that I'm doing is that we do still see a lot of focus on this idea of bouncing back. And I think that is that is problematic if resilience is going to be this the sort of organizing principle or, or a, yeah. a major goal for cities, right? Um, because but it's yeah, end because of then bite, it becomes right? this this kind of yeah this not very transformative goal, and I think that is problematic because I think all of us probably agree that our cities, as they currently are, are not uh, completely sustainable. They're you know not completely just, and that there are changes and I think pretty fundamental transformations that are needed to actually get us there, right? Um, not to mention that we then throw in, uh, you know, future climate change and, and you know, things like that and how, how that's gonna change our cities and we'll have to, I think just have to make changes. And again, so that's why I think that this idea of this more bounce forward resilience is, is what we need to have um, if we're gonna have a more, if we're gonna use resilience in this, this normative way. It, yeah, I, I, I totally, feel what you say because i've seen it in in my everyday uh work as well with the which is end of pipe solutions rather than addressing the root of the issue um and this is whenever we talk about complex issues right whenever there is a systemic challenge it's extremely hard to to well to already well you mentioned how hard and how fuzzy the topic was inside of academia so we can only imagine how difficult it is when applied to you know policy practice and all of that and so that's in in a sense some of these disciplines exist for a long time yet they're still so young because they they still don't manage to to pass the threshold of getting applied or speaking the right words to the cities in order to, to get to the complex part of it, right? To get to the, okay, we need to plan now for 50 years time. We, you, you don't have the, you, you, we mentioned it before, right? Cities are open systems. The, the administrative boundaries do not make sense when we talk about resilience. The administrative boundaries do not make sense when we talk about, you know, climate mitigation and all of that. Yet we need to act here to either protect us from something that comes from elsewhere or to you know better the the the, the entire planet in, in a way so how do we go from this fuzzy concept which i think a lot of people are attracted to it because it's a metaphor it speaks to us there is an image you know this bouncing uh back or forward we, we can visually see it right uh but how do we then implement anything, right? Or how do we help cities along this uh, journey? 
Yeah. I mean, well, I think that the, you know, where the, the rubber really hits the road, right. (laughs) And resilience is, is in negotiating these five W questions. Mm. Right. And so sort of what we argue is that you're always going to be answering. So remind these uh, five uh, resilience, sorry, remind Mm -hmm. these five W. So it's, it's uh, urban resilience for whom, what, when, where, and why, right? So thinking about who's defining the resilience agenda, who they're, who you're trying to actually assist, right? Um, who's included, who's not. Um, then the the what is like, what are you trying to be resilient um, to, right? Like, it, are you, which hazards uh, or, or threats are you considering, right? Um, you know, what aspects, what's included in the urban systems, right? So how are you bounding uh, that in some way, right? So what, what are you trying to make resilience to what, resilient to what? Um, the who, or sorry, who, what, when is of course about what sort of spatial or um, sorry, what sort of temporal scales are you thinking about, right? Are you planning for 10 years down the line, five years or 50 years, a hundred years, right? That makes a huge difference. Um, then where, of course, again, the sort of spatial elements of how you, you bound your system. Um, and then why is, is really getting at these, these fundamental uh, motivations for resilience, right? What are the, those normative goals? And I think, uh, you know, all of these, again, how you answer them, there's going to be trade-offs to that. And, and so in some of the work, we've actually tried to like show that, right? So if, like using an example, say, of, of a um, green infrastructure planning policy, say a city has. And if your goal um, is, you know, to increase access to green space, you might put green infrastructure, say, in very different places than you would if your goal is, you know, reducing flooding, right, stormwater management. So again, these different yeah. different uh, responses have different um, outcomes. There's trade-offs between them that you need to do. So you're always going to be answering these. The question is, I think, how transparent are you being about it, right? And who gets to participate in those negotiations? Um, and so what we've sort of argued for is, is that that should be, yeah, that should be out in the open. You should be um, clear about, about those choices and what try to think through at least some of the trade-offs related to that, because I think we often don't, right? We just sort of, um, yeah, forge ahead and, you know, develop some, some resilience policy and, and don't necessarily think through all of, you know, how, who that's going to affect and, and how, and, um, what those, yeah, what those answers, um, what the implications are for them. So that's really what, what I think, um, that gets to. I also think that, you know, thinking about, okay, well, how do you actually apply resilience to, I think another important thing is that it's not just about say physical systems, right. But it is also about governance. And I, I mean, maybe that's my, my bias coming back, going back to my, you know, political science uh, bachelor's, but I, I, I do think in all the work I've done talking with city, you know, folks looking at, at examples, I think that, that often it's not um, as much of a technical issue as much as it is a governance um, challenge. Right. And so I think that you, you just can't, um, I think you can't overestimate how important that is. Mm-hmm. And so more practically, I mean, let's imagine, so flood, I guess, is the the easiest one we can always think of when it comes to city planning. I can imagine also, you know, planting trees or making some urban agriculture for mm-hmm. uh, local, let's say, uh, food sufficiency. How do we know that these really make your city more resilient? You know, there is also some... <laughs> I, I, I'm an optimist and I believe that we should do it. And I agree that it's a, it's a probably the, the right way forward, but of course it's hard knowing the myriad of, you know, changes that are facing, uh, that we're, we're going to face and we don't know what we don't know. So there's, how do we know that we're increasing resilience or, well, I guess we can't, but, uh, is there like a priority list? Is there like, how do we, advance in this, uh, you know, because at the end of the day, of course, they want to, once they have answered these questions, they do not necessarily tell you what are the actions, right? Where, what is the, 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 the next step? Yeah. I mean, I think, I think measuring resilience, right. Is 
very challenging. <laughs> um, and I think that the, you know, maybe even like, especially if we're thinking holistically about like, we're gonna measure a city's resilience. I sort of feel like it's almost impossible. <laughs> But I think what we we have started to do instead, and I think this is, you know, I think this makes sense, is to try to figure out what are the characteristics um, of more resilient systems. So are there sort of general characteristics of systems that make, that support uh, resilience in general, right? Um, and so things like diversity, right? And there is a lot of research that shows that increasing diversity, whether we're talking about, you know, physical infrastructure, things like electricity systems, or uh, we're talking about ecosystems, or we're talking about governance, right? Having a diversity of factors participating um, or inclusive governance, that all of those tend to have sort of better outcomes, right? So diversity seems to be a characteristic that generally supports resilience. And, you know, we can try to, we can sort of start to think about how we might measure diversity of a particular um, part of a, a city, right? Um, or a certain urban system. Uh, redundancy, right, is another characteristic that there's you know, quite a bit of work showing that having some functional redundancy is really important to resilience, right? That if you have a very overly optimized system that that actually can be, you know, potentially make it brittle. Um, and so, yeah, so we need to think about how making sure that we have that. And again, we could, we could potentially measure that. So I think that's where I see um, the most potential for really trying to to measure resilience um, is in is thinking about these characteristics and, and trying to assess those and, and foster those um, in particular systems. Right, so we, we can never have a resilient city. We can only plan for a more resilient city, more or less. I mean, I think that, yeah, I think that's true. I mean, I think it's probably impossible to be for everything to be resilient to everything, right? <laughs> I mean, to make a city, to have all aspects of a city that is resilient to every possible disruption thing is, is yes, impossible. But I think we can work on actively fostering our resilience. And so, yeah, so if you tell me what is the resilient city, I would not have an answer for you, yeah. right? Because I don't think uh, that sort of definitive endpoint exists. Um, but I think we can start to think of where are some examples of, you know, what, what would, what might enhance resilience in different cities. I'm wondering, um, did you follow a bit? Probably you did. Uh, I didn't uh, too much because uh, it's, it's not something I, I know too much, but the, this whole initiative that unfortunately ended this a hundred resilient cities back in the day, that was a big thing, right? Uh, was it Bloomberg that funded this thing? And then, there were many chief resilient officers all mm -hmm. around the planet. So what was that about? And was it sure. interesting? Um, yeah. yeah. So I have followed it. So it was the Rockefeller Foundation uh, Rockefeller. who yeah, initiated yeah, it. Yeah. Um, uh, and so I think Bloomberg has, has also contributed towards thinking about resilience, certainly in climate um, change as well. But yeah, the Rockefeller Foundation and, you know, this the 100 Resilient Cities program really was one of the bigger drivers, I think, globally of this res urban resilience agenda, right? I think you you also can't, I think it probably was the biggest driver. Um, and, you know, although it is now sort of ended, I think it really did push cities worldwide, right? Because what it did was it, it um, cities around the world applied to be part of this network. Um, and then they received uh, resources, financial, but also different um, different support, right, and um, and technical support, help, et cetera, access to different um, consultants and things. To the main thing was hiring a chief resilience officer, as you mentioned, um, in the city, and that the Rockefeller Foundation really wanted the the program wanted those to be a sort of high level position who would really work. I mean, they they actually specifically recognized that they wanted to transform urban governance, right? Uh, which I think is a, is a great goal, um, but a very lofty one, right? Uh, and I, you know, I wasn't like, I wasn't on the inside, so I can't say exactly how, how they feel that um, that worked out. Um, but I have actually interviewed, well, I've looked at, at a number of these plans that came out of it. So they also had to develop, so they hired chief resilience officer and they had to develop a resilience strategy, essentially a plan, right? In each of the cities. Um, and I've, I've done a number of analyses on these 
the plans, these strategies, uh, because I think they do provide a really kind of nice, uh, you know, convenient sample uh, to look at how cities are thinking about resilience, right? How are they defining it? Uh, what things, uh, what policies are they prioritizing, right? How do they compare if, if this is going to be a new push that cities are going to be developing these resilience plans instead of maybe climate adaptation plans? Like how do those differ, right? So we had um, one study that I worked on with uh, Sierra Woodruff, uh, who's at Texas A&M, uh, looked um, specifically at, as well as other colleagues, looked specifically, she was the, the lead author on this, compared specifically resilience, these resilience strategies to uh, climate adaptation plans in cities and looked at, you know, sort of this really, well, the conclusion was that there were really strengths and weaknesses to these different approaches. Like the resilience plans were, were different um, in some significant ways, um, but not clearly better or worse than the, the climate adaptation plans for cities were developing. Um, and then I also did a project where we actually interviewed a number of these chief resilience officers um, in the, the 100 resilient cities, um, as well as, uh, and sort of asked them how they were organizing their resilience efforts and how they were thinking about resilience as well there. Um, and yeah, and there were a lot of interesting, well, a lot of interesting thoughts out of that in terms of, you know, pros and cons to, to how they were organizing their work and where these say chief resilience officers actually worked, like were they yeah. in the mayor's office versus were they, uh, you know, in a, in a embedded within, you know, public works department or some, you know, other sort of city department, uh, thinking about those sort of institutional design uh, elements and, and organize, organizational factors. Um, and then also looking specifically at did another project where we looked specifically at the resilience plans and looked at how they were addressing social equity, right? Or in many mm -hmm. cases um, weren't. And, and again, there we found like a huge amount of variation in terms of at one extreme, we had uh, like the city of Boston, uh, Massachusetts in the US, which was had made their sort of entire resilience strategy was focused on racial equity and social justice, right? Um, and then you had sort of another extreme, um, say the, the city of Boulder, Colorado, their resilience plan didn't even really discuss social equity or justice at all, right? So a lot of variation um, in terms of there and, and thinking about, well, what would it mean to have, you know, to plan for social equity in the context of urban resilience planning? So yeah, lots of, I think, different things, I think, um, I think it was a really interesting program. I think it really advanced discussions about resilience. Um, I think one thing that's interesting with, yeah, was this idea that they, they did, I think, really sort of uh, espouse this more bounced forward thinking about resilience. So they really did want to transform, as I said, uh, governance. They wanted to, um, to think about resilience as actually adapting and improving um, as a result of potential disruptions. Um, but I think it's, it's still very much, uh, I think there's, uh, yeah, I think there's a lot of questions about to what extent it really did, you know, transform the way cities are governing. Um, also, of course, this program did end. And I think, you know, once the, once the funding dried up for that, for, for cities and things, I think there's a lot of questions about, you know, to what extent I'd be interested to look, you know, a few years down the line to see, how many of these resilience officer positions still exist, um, you know, whether those resilience strategies have actually been, the plans have actually been implemented, um, et cetera, right? Yeah, it's a, I mean, it's a fascinating example to, especially I imagine for you to, to have this sample of cities, to have this international um, exper experiments, uh, because of course you have different cities around the globe, so you have different contexts to to see how this works. Do you know if there was like a um, resemblance, or did the Rockefeller Foundation kind of push towards a harmonization or one way of resilience or not? Because you said that you had many variations, but I'm curious: is that because the context was different? So the urban administration where that person was parachuted landed and therefore the context kind of begged the difference or was it the the person themselves so i don't know if uh, of that uh, officer was uh, trained in resilience did they come from abroad or how did they know resilience because of course in 
often is like, who knows how to explain this topic? It's so complex that you need someone that already is fluent in resiliency to be able to, to work with them, right? Yeah, I think that's a great question. And, and my, you know, from what I've seen, I think it really varied, right? So some cities, uh, you know, some cities created the, you know, chose their, or hired a chief resilience officer who had worked in the city um, locally. I would say a lot of the cities actually chose someone who was really embedded locally, right? And had a lot of knowledge of the city. And I think that's really important, right? Um, I think that would be at least as important as the actual, as knowledge of resilience, right? Um, and so I think probably I'm guessing that there was some potentially in some cities, some tension between, you know, opportunities to choose someone who maybe was really knowledgeable about resilience, um, but who didn't necessarily know the, the particular context of the city. And um, from what I've seen, I think more often they, they chose people locally, which again, I think makes sense because every city is unique. And I think, I think in terms of, again, you know, I wasn't like specifically involved in, in developing a strategy in a city, but just from looking at them, I think there is definitely the Rockefeller Foundation or the 100 Resilient City Program definitely gave guidance um, because there are clear commonalities across the plans. There are certain, you know, certain elements that are included, say, in the strategy. So I, I definitely think there was guidelines um, and guidance on that. And so you do see, you know, so if, if each of these cities were just to develop completely their own plan in isolation, I would guess that they would be more different than they were. Um, but the plans did vary a lot too. And so I think that there was, it was obviously probably, a, I'm guessing, sort of a, a compromise between those elements, right? And I think the other thing too, that's interesting about the, the 100 Resilient Cities program, and this is part, sort of a, this goes beyond just this program, is that there is a lot of work that's looked at the role of these kind of city networks, right? These international, whether we're talking about 100 Resilient Cities or the C40 program or uh, all the work that ICLEI has done, right? The cities learn a lot from each other. Um, and I think, you know, regardless, even if, if, you know, again, it's, it's hard to know how much of the similarities were because the cities were looking at other cities' strategies and learning from them. And they definitely encouraged that. And actively, I, I, my sense is that that was a part of the goal of the program as well, right? Um, and that makes sense because we, we know from, from other research that these, these city networks um, can be helpful and that city officials say that they, you know, really do learn from their peers and that that's something that 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 can be a really important resource. Um, and so making that, you know, as easy as possible, I think is a good thing, right? And connecting um, these different officials. So yeah, so yeah, I think there um, there's probably some of that as well uh, in the network and hard to determine how much of that is, is just because they would, you know, because there was this network and they were learning from each other versus how much was actually the program saying you need to <laughs> yeah. include these elements and define resilience in this way, et cetera. Yeah. Um... Yeah, I'm wondering, especially, well, whether they managed or how do you manage to to deal with this um, um, trade-off uh, elements? Because you mentioned uh, that this was something very important in the in the five Ws, but I can imagine this is also when cities come together and discuss resilience. They all have different contextual challenges, yet some must remain right. Uh, so they all have like grids, grids of flows, or they all have social uh, structures, or they all have some type of nature inside of their city. So there are some common elements, but then of course is what do you do with them and how do you approach it? So how do we, do you know of any ways or how, when you discuss with cities or if you had to do it, how, how do you trade off between all of these like super difficult challenges that are all equally important and all like, if you mess it up, then you can screw a city up more or less. Yeah, that is, I mean, I think that is a great question and maybe the ultimate question that cities are having to face, right. With resilience. So I think, um, you're never going to completely escape that, right. Um, you have conflicting priorities, um, you have limited resources, and that is a fundamental challenge, right? And cities are always going to be facing this, I think. But um, so, yeah, so what do you do about it? Well, um, I think one thing you want to do is, uh, again, is, is 
try to identify those, right? So that's an important first step is figuring out, okay, where do these trade-offs exist? Um, and I think we often don't do that. Um, you know, where are there conflicting priorities and try to avoid unnecessary uh, conflicts, right? So like, just for example, right? Cities have, on the one hand, many cities are facing a, you know, housing affordability crisis, housing shortages, right? Um, and so they need more housing, uh, they need more affordable housing. On the other hand, cities, uh, say coastal cities, right, are facing sea level rise and honestly probably need to be thinking seriously about managed retreat, right? Um, and moving away from, you know, future sea level rise, uh, you know, areas. But that means if you're a coastal city, you have limited land, um, you know, you have these two goals and, and it, it's challenging, right? Um, because, you know, you might want to be taking whatever land you have and, and building more housing on it, right? Um, but, but then you also kind of need to be moving uh, away from those. So a very obvious thing it seem, would seem is that you shouldn't be building new housing, at least in, say, flood prone areas, right? But the reality is that um, that cities still are in many places, right? Um, and so I think you know part of it is about about making sure that your different policies and plans are aligned, right? And that's something that I've been working on thinking um, thinking about for flooding, um, and also moving forward, I'll be thinking about this for for heat as well as okay, how can you know you have to think about all of the different uh, you know, different policies that a city has in different plans and are they actually aligned or are they working at cross purposes? And like, so we were actually analyzing the, what we're called, what we call the sort of network of plans in a city um, and looking so climate at adaptation policies. and uh, let's say transportation and all of that, you mean as network of yeah, plans? Yeah, so these would be really all of the different city um, city scale, they could be regional scale, but also neighborhood scale, right? Plans that are collectively going to shape urban development, right? So yes, so this is your comprehensive or your general plan, right? Your land use plans. This includes your hazard. In the US, we, we have hazard mitigation plans, it include your ad, you know, climate adaptation plan, any kind of infrastructure plans you have, right? Parks and recreation or open space plans. So often these are developed, right, in kind of in silos in within cities, right? Um, so you have different agencies, different uh, departments who are developing these plans and they might not necessarily know what the other ones are doing in their plan. They might not actually necessarily be aligned. And that's obviously, and we, we see this, right? So we actually like analyze um, the policies in these plans. We try to map them out and you see that there are contradictions, right? Whereas for example, um, you might have a, say like a downtown master plan or economic development plan or even comprehensive plan that's calling for new housing or new development in areas that the hazard mitigation plan is saying we should not be building in because this is a flood zone, right? Um, and so, you know, a, I think a first step uh, is trying to get these aligned um, and trying to, to deal with that, right? So that, that's step one. I think um, another important element is trying to figure out if there are win-wins that you have, right? And so I think this is really why we see so much emphasis um, these days on green infrastructure or nature-based solutions, right? is because there is, um, there's a feeling, and I think, you know, there's definitely some, some <laughs> there's definitely some evidence for this, that they can have multiple benefits, right? Multiple co-benefits. And so could you de develop, say, you know, a park that also can help to retain stormwater um, when you have, you know, a big storm event, um, and that can also help to cool the city as we're facing, you know, unprecedented heat waves and um, extreme heat risks. And so, so yeah, so how can you actually, you know, where are their, their policies and, and developments that could actually achieve multiple goals, right? Um, and that would be also flexible in, you know, future, different future climates. So thinking about, okay, are these really sort of robust strategies that are gonna hold up, you know, regardless of, of what ultimately kind of happens with our climate. Um, so I think those are, those are really important. But often, again, one of the challenges there in terms of actually implementing those effectively um, and, and really 
say leveraging the opportunities for for multiple benefits or those win-wins is that you actually have to have say different departments and things talking to each other, right? So you do have to break down uh, the silos in in governance. Um, and because for example, if we take like green infrastructure, right? Um, you know, you have the, the parks, maybe parks and recreation department who is in charge of developing new parks, uh, you know, for people to recreate in. Um, and then you have like a stormwater utility who's in, whose job is to prevent you know, flooding and to manage uh, precipitation, right? And make sure that areas, the city doesn't flood. Those two departments, you know, might not necessarily be sharing their budgets or working, you know, be used to collaborating closely together, but in order to really, you know, maximize resources and, you know, I think leverage these, um, capitalize on these win-wins, they would need to do that. And so, um, that just requires sort of new collaborations, trying to, again, break down these these different silos. And that can be sometimes difficult. So that's where I would get where I get to this idea of like everything's a governance challenge. Right. <laughs> yeah, uh, it hits home so hard. It's a uh, I'm facing similar stuff like, uh, you know, in circular economies like, OK, we need to somehow make flows more circular within cities. Great. Where are we going to put these productive activities that are going to do so? Nowhere because we want more residential areas. Great. So no uh, recycling then, no uh, repairing. Oh, uh, but we still want it. Sure. But how do we do that then? <laughs> it feels like this infinite loop. Um, perhaps a, a last question uh, before I ask you the, the two uh, usual questions uh, of the end is, I can imagine that you, you have to become a very um, future-oriented person when you work with resilience you have to think about or very creative person you need to think through all of the you know what ifs or all of the scenario or all of the you know future states of what's going to be a city in one century right because as you said these are complex adaptive systems right what we know today of a city uh, is not what we what was in the past and it's definitely not what's going to be in the future so um I can imagine it's, it can be a lot of fun to imagine uh, all of this. It can be also very daunting. Like I, I don't have a single clue about, you know, what uh, the future pandemic is going to be or what the future economic shock is going to be or uh, environmental. We just have a glimpse of what is happening. So I don't know, do you just sit and, and ponder about what are the, the future challenges or how, because of course there's the practical elements that you do now with cities because it's, relatively short term but i can imagine in your free time you also ponder about all of these other elements right yeah i mean i think yeah i mean yeah definitely i think about it right um and i mean sometimes in the face of all of the challenges that we're facing i can find it a bit uh depressing quite honestly to yeah. like go down that I mean when I think so I grew up in in South Florida right in Southeast Florida Fort Lauderdale Florida and you know South Florida is facing a huge future climate challenge and sometimes when I try to think about how that's going to be resolved right knowing everything we know about uh you know finance and and governance and politics it's um yeah, I really struggle with it. And sometimes it's, it's challenging. Right. And I think there has been among the like climate change community, there's been more emphasis lately on, on like mental health and being yeah. sure to try to, to take care of yourself, right. That you can't advance, uh, climate, climate issues. If you are, uh, yeah, if you're like, just uh, not in a good mental space and mental mm. health uh, space, but it, it can be be difficult when you see all the inequities um, and you feel like there's just this huge looming uh, disaster that we're not necessarily um, like taking effective uh, measures against, right? So I think that that, that can be hard um, sometimes. And I try, but I try not to do that and instead focus on where you see these um yeah, hopeful elements, sort of bright spots, right? And I, I think like that's, you know, for example, the um, the um, the seeds of a good Anthropocene. I don't know if you've seen that, Elena Bennett and all uh, other colleagues that work. I think 
think it's important that we have those, right? These like good examples, positive examples. I know a lot of my um, my colleagues who have been working on the urban resilience to extremes research networks, the Eurex, um, they've been doing a lot of work on future scenarios um, and planning those. And I think that's another area where, yeah, we have, we have to think through um, different positive visions. Um, if we don't have some vision of what we want the future to look like, how do we get there? So, so yeah, so I also try to try to think about those opportunities and how we could, how, what, what would a, a desirable future, more resilient city look like? Um, and yeah, what are some of the elements of all the, you know, I love, I think one of the reasons that I ended up really wanting to focus on cities is just because I've always loved them. I love going to them. I love traveling to different cities. I love how different they are. Um, I just always feel energized when I'm in a, a new city exploring it, right? Um, I love history. And so I love that element and how it combines with, um, you know, what, how the, you see the legacies of history, but also how it, you know, combines with, with current um, characteristics. And so I think there's, also, yeah, a lot of, of, I think you can look at different examples and kind of pull different pieces that are interesting from different cities and that, uh, that you'd want to see in future cities and try to work towards that. So yeah, try to try to stay. I think I'm generally a, a fairly optimistic person. And so I try to be, although sometimes it, it feels a little daunting as well. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I feel you. It's a uh, same here. It's a, uh... The small wins are what make us, uh, I can imagine, <laughs> keep, uh, yeah, keep pushing. Yeah, I think I'm, I've become more and more okay with like incremental improvements while still keeping a transformative vision um, of where we want to go, right? Yeah, especially when, I mean, when we look at infrastructure, it's like decades, if not like half century projects and they, they transform all of that. So, yeah, I mean... If every day of these 50 years we, we get uh, thinking about this, it's a bit long. Um, yeah, so I wanted to, I generally finish with two main questions, which is uh, wh what's next? So what are you focusing right now? And wh what is your plan for the rest of the year or, you know, this year to come? Uh, and then some books and articles that you would like to recommend. Sure. So um, I think the sort of two big research projects that I'm focusing on right now, uh, focus really on, on flooding and extreme heat planning, as I sort of, I've kind of alluded to pieces of them. And those of course do happen to be the sort of costliest uh, flooding and deadliest weather and climate hazards in the US at least. Um, and so with both of these, I'm really interested in how they're governed, right? Um, across cities and also trying to kind of develop new methods for analyzing the relationships between um, the, the different plans, right? The cities are developed, developing. And so looking at the policies in these plans, again, so, so getting to this, this, some of this stuff that I was talking about earlier, right? Where you making sure that the plans are actually aligned, looking at where policies are targeting, are they sort of uh, equitably distributed across cities? Um, are they, targeting the areas that are most vulnerable, right? Um, so how do we, you know, plan more strategically, right? And thinking about this again, um, and how we ultimately like break down kind of silos and, and how do we work towards more aligned um, planning efforts, right? For both of these. So, um, so yeah, so I had this one project that's looking at flooding in four um, coastal cities in the US. Uh, we've been working on this for the last couple of years. Um, and so this was with Sierra Woodruff and Bryce Hannibal, who are at Texas A&M, as well as uh, three PhD students at ASU and um, Texas A&M. And we've been like combining uh, surveys of different organizations involved in flood planning, social network analysis of the um, from those surveys. So looking at like who's collaborating with who. Um, and then we also have analyzed all of the different plans in the networks. And we're trying to really ultimately kind of question how resilience has been operationalized. And so two of those cities are, are 100 resilient cities uh, yeah. members, and then two of them specifically were not. And we're trying to understand like how they're thinking about resilience, uh, whether this focus, a focus on resilience is really like increased collaboration. Um, and then does this increase collaboration? Do we actually see that like breaking down, you know, does it do, does breaking down sort of silos actually lead to like more integrated 
plans um, that are hopefully going to reduce vulnerability to flooding and sea level rise. So that's sort of one um, project. Um, and so, for example, one finding that we're coming out from that is that um, although like hazard, so in the U.S., uh, we have these hazard mitigation plans that that most communities are basically required to develop um, in order to be eligible for federal um, disaster like mitigation or disaster grants, right? Um, and then many cities are also developing these climate separate sort of climate change adaptation plans. And we find that, um, you know, they're, they have sort of a common goal, right? Of reducing risk, <laughs> flooding risks, um, but they are quite distinct and are usually very separated, developed by different, uh, different people in the cities. Uh, they, you know, require sort of more integration. So just like one example. Um, and then another, uh, project that I'll be working a lot on um, over the next year in the summer is, uh, you know, perhaps not surprisingly, since moving to Arizona, I've started focusing a lot more on urban heat resilience planning. Um, and so what we're finding, um, and so if with this work, I'm working very closely with uh, a researcher, Lad Keith at the University of Arizona. So it's a, a very Arizona strong <laughs> uh, team. And we're, you know, we're finding that there's lots of studies on urban heat modeling and design, but there really is not a lot um, that's actually focused on governance of heat. And, and you know, compared with flooding, at least in the US, heat is really, um, there's just a lot, it's a lot less advanced um, in terms of how we actually manage this hazard. And so we're trying to uh, help address that, right? So we're, um, we did some surveys of different city planners across the US to try to understand like how they were thinking about heat, what they're actually doing, what strategies they're implementing. So for example, we found that uh, urban forestry, like vegetation is the most common strategy that cities say they're using for heat. Um, uh, but then also like what kind of information do they use about heat and um, what sort of gaps there are in information sources um, for that? What kind of plans are they actually implementing? heat strategies in. So are they doing it in hazard mitigation plans or in comprehensive plans, et cetera? And we're thinking about uh, how could we look, you know, wh what are heat strategies across plans? And again, how like sort of aligned are they? Um, and then we're also developing guidance. So we're actually working with the American Planning Association to try to develop, uh, and we're gonna write some reports on, on, on heat planning to try to actually give practical guidance to cities on what are the strategies that they can implement, how should they be thinking about extreme heat. Um, and yeah, and because it's going to be, you know, an increasing problem, you know, around the world moving forward. So, so those are some of the, the, I think the two biggest projects that I'll be working on over the next, uh, next year, for sure. Yeah, pretty full on, I guess. Uh, so I'm looking forward to, to all of them. So before you go, some uh, books or articles or videos or something you, you would recommend uh, people to, to read on this topic or any other topic? Yeah, sure. So, you know, speaking of thinking about future, uh, future cities and, and resilience, um, I think I would recommend a new book. Um, it's open. It's an open access Springer book that was edited by a number of the urban resilience to extremes uh, SRN, so the UREX um, researchers. So it was led by Zoe Hampstead, who's at Buffalo, David Iwaniak, Georgia State, Tymon McPherson, Marta Burbis, Elizabeth Cook, and Tisha Muniz Erickson were the um, editors of that, and uh, many other collaborators. But it's really so that that project um, that's been you know going on for the last five years. Um, it's just sort of coming to an end to the extent that a huge you know, multi-year project ever really ends, um, research project. But it's really, I think, synthesizing a lot of the, the key insights from this work. As I said, they've been um, doing these uh, planning scenarios with nine cities in the US and Latin America. Um, and so, you know, a lot of a lot about urban resilience thinking in there and a number of, of some of, I think, the biggest, you know, thinkers on, in this topic are, are part of the book and contributors. So uh, I would definitely check that out. And nicely- And how is it called? Access. It's called Resilient Urban Futures. Resilient Urban Futures, cool. Yeah, and so if you search up Hamstead, Zoe Hamstead, uh, she's the first first editor um, for that, then you probably find it. Very cool. Um, and then, well, I also have been, I mean, I would assume that your subscribers are probably into to podcasts. Um, so actually I've been really enjoying lately America Adapts. So it is a little bit more American focused. Um, but I think it does, you know, cover a lot of different 
um, adaptation concepts and, and case studies. Uh, I think it's really quite a, quite a good podcast and a lot of, you know, good thinkers on this topic um, who are participating in that. The only caveat being that it is a little bit U.S. centric. Um, and then I've also been enjoying the A Matter of Degrees podcast on climate change, um, I think is also very timely and interesting if you're interested in, in sort of climate policy more broadly. Mm -hmm. Very, very cool. I have uh, plenty of uh, things to read and to listen then. Thanks a lot. Um, well, thanks again, uh, Sarah, so much for taking the time and for sharing all of your knowledge and insights out of urban uh, resilience. Yeah, thanks for having me. And uh, thanks everyone as well to listening until the end. Uh, please uh, make sure to share this episode with friends and colleagues that might enjoy it as well. And we'll see you in the next one. Cheers. Thank you.